key to the phrase covenant of salt, which he's discovered appears three times in its pages. We have that covenant, he claims, and goes on to tell me of a Middle Eastern saying that turns two of the commonest ingredients into something blessed and profound. There is bread and salt between us. We have cooked a thousand meals for one another. We have held a spoon to the other's mouth and asked if the soup needs more salt. We have broken bread and offered across our table a holy covenant. Day after day after day, we have tasted the brine of each other's skin. For over half my life, Patrick has been my lover, friend, and partner, everything I'd want a spouse to be. Yet during our time together, we've resisted the sentimental and the conventionally romantic. Neither of us has wanted to collect or display photographs. We've never owned a camera, though I'm pleased to see in our publicity shots, we're leaning into each other and laughing. Even now, in his reduced state, he comes up with witticisms as quick as fireflies, startling the dark. At least I can still make you laugh, he says. We've never lost sound or sight of each other, even when we're in different cities. Is that rare or normal in a long relationship? Yet we forget our anniversary. What year was it we got married? And neglect to buy flowers on special days. We work alone in our rooms until supper, barely speaking, and we can attend a party at someone else's house and not cross paths until one of us gives the nod that means, let's leave. And then there is our bickering. Friends who know us well shake their heads. There they go again, they say, as we spark across the dinner table, vehemently disagreeing with what the other just said. Our bantering defines us. It has become a kind of play, a darting in to take a sporting nip and darting out again. The tone of our words may not sound light and harmless, and there's no doubt we easily get annoyed and piss the other off. But the squabbling is part of who we are, and it can't be quashed, even when it makes those around us uncomfortable. In Pursuits of Happiness, his study of classic Hollywood comedy, Stanley Cavell remarks, there may be bickering that is itself a mark, not of bliss exactly, but say of caring, as if a willingness for marriage entails a certain willingness for bickering. After an evening where we've both been particularly pugnacious, do I dare say Patrick more than me? I read that passage to him when I came across it after dipping in and out of books on our shelves. Maybe we agreed with some relief. In spite of the distress of our friends, we were going to be okay. Am I audible? <laughs> Yes. Okay, great. I was uh, muted there for a while. Um, uh, th that's, that was one of the many passages I really loved in the book. Um, uh, I'm going to start off, uh, I guess we're supposed to be talk just dis having a discussion and asking each other questions. I wanted to, one thing I wanted to know about was the, the sort of meandering, uh, very natural, um, I guess I could say molecular structure of the book. It almost felt like you were just um, discussing your life with someone I mean obviously it's more way more crafted than that but just the the structure itself is a very natural uh, I guess organic uh, would be the word to use here uh, organic feel but was it actually I was wondering if it was actually carefully mapped out and that feeling of naturalness and improvisation and and you know just the improvisational digressions and so on is that just a carefully wrought illusion or did you just kind of write it without mapping out the progress, because as you said, there are three different th narrative threads or several narrative threads and you're tying them all together and just moving into different parts of the story in a way that feels, as I said, kind of molecular and natural. Um, I don't know how to write an entire book because for most of my life, I've been a poet and I've written one poem after another, even when uh, the book of poetry had a single concept like God, 
for instance, or stories from the Bible or objects. I've still just written one page at a time. So I approached this book with the same idea. I just started writing. And so I like your word, just a sort of an inspirational flow. Um, I just went from a part about our past to a part about our present to putting in a poem to talking about writing and just let it happen as it was happening, um, as I was writing it. And I kind of worried that that might be confusing. I wasn't sure how it was uh, piecing together. And I, I had a very, very good editor, Kelly Joseph from McClellan and Stewart, who helped me uh, structure it where there were bumps. She helped me smooth those out. But essentially, Steve, I, I didn't know what I was doing. And I know some novelists have outlines and some write the way that most of us write a poem, that you begin with the opening line. And then when you get to the end of the poem, you, you know you're at the end because you get there. But you don't say, well, I'm going to say this in stanza two and this in stanza three and, and move towards the conclusion. I, I wrote this book in, in the same way. It just kind of being a skier on the top of a hill and pushing myself off and knowing I was going to get to the bottom. And I had planned on ending the book with the death of our 19-year-old cat. Um, I knew that would be where I would stop. And I started writing it two and a half years before he died. So I thought when our cat Basho, named after the haiku poet, dies, the book will end. And uh, Patrick was still alive at that time. That was November 2019. And he died in March of the following year. Um, I think I've got my years wrong. November 2018, he died uh, March 2019. So that was my only plan. I knew where it would end, and uh, I didn't know about the rest of it. Mm. I want to ask, uh, say something about what I think our books have in common. You, the part that you read, I wrote that wonderful sentence down where you talk about, um, oh, thrust into a role of serious responsibility for which I felt unequipped. Maybe we were paired at this festival because that happened to both of us. Um, you thrust yourself into a foreign country to be a volunteer and a worker with no expertise in any of the fields, any of the things you were asked to do. And I was thrust into the foreign country of my beloved's illness and didn't know what to do, was unprepared. Right. And and like you, I felt, I felt scared shitless a lot of days. And I just want to say how much I admired you for, for doing that and how much I enjoyed the character in your book, Who Is You? And the humility, uh, the, the, the way you mocked yourself as you struggled to live up to the expectations. They were something else. It was harrowing, wasn't it? Yeah, at times, for for sure, when I was um, uh, when I was trying to help that woman, and I didn't really know what I was doing. Yeah, it was it was harrowing. Um, by the way, I, I, I'm thinking again about you're talking about how you wrote your book, kind of the way you write a poem. I usually write fiction the same way, especially short stories. It's just a free fall. I have no, I don't even know how the story is going to end, and I found it kind of hard writing uh, a memoir. Uh, initially it was very hard because I actually know what happened. Like, I don't have to discover the story in the telling. I actually have the parts and I didn't want to improvise too much. I wanted to stick pretty much to what happened. And I, and I decided pretty early on, I, the structure would be fairly chronological. So I would have to be creative in other ways. Um, and it was actually really hard at first not to keep change. I wanted, I wanted to change stuff. I wanted to embellish and extrapolate and digress. And, and, um, and I did that to a very limited extent to make the book work. But on the whole, it felt very hard initially being constrained by uh, actual things that happened. Um, and that was part of your um, respect for the very real people that you were working with, I would presume, that you had to somehow remain true to their intention and their lives and the work they were doing. Yeah, absolutely. They, they were, uh, I dedicated the book to um, three of the volunteers who are all still there. 
And I can say honestly that they're heroes to me, not heroes in a sort of, you know, you know, fairy story, you know, storybook sense uh, where people are perfect. They, they certainly weren't. And there's one scene that I, I really, uh, Omiros is like the real hero of the book. He's a remarkable man. But you know, one night he got, he got very silly and he said some stupid things and he showed me a really kind of uh, unpleasant video. And I realized after the fact, this is because he's letting off steam because he is working so hard, 16 hours a day, and he's being silly now. And it reminded me of that that W.H. Auden line about Yeats, uh, in the elegy for Yeats, you were silly like us, your genius survived it. And I decided I need to put that scene in. I, I don't know how he'll feel when he reads it. He might be hurt. I think he'll be okay because he knows heroes are human. And it, it's, the, it's the humanizing moment, it's the anchor moment where, um, where you see he's 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 a real person who has these flaws and who breaks down and does silly things like you know drinking too much smoking too much he, he didn't do that but that's the sort of thing people do um when they're under that kind of pressure oh well that was a digression i don't think you asked me anything <laughs> that's okay. um yeah, and that reminds me of the scene in in your book where there's a garden party when patrick is well, for lack of a better word, in remission. He's he's home for several weeks and you have a garden party to celebrate that. And you talk about how the whole thing is a blur and you were you're putting the wine back just partly, maybe, maybe it was anxiety partly or nervousness, maybe it was just kind of celebration of this moment and excitement. Um, but I, I found that moving too, you know, very human moment where um yeah, and um and that oh, that brings me to a question. You talked about not managing to, you, you said you stored some snapshots of that event, but on the whole, it's a blur. And that reminded me of another passage where you talked about how you and Patrick had never owned a camera. Mm -hmm. You didn't take photos. Um, and I thought that was interesting because I've never had a camera and I don't take photos when I travel. I travel, you know, I've traveled in some beautiful places and have not taken a single photo. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to say why that is in my case. I'm not even sure why it is, but I was wondering if in your case, is it because you and Patrick tended to, well, I'll let you speak for yourself, tended to document things verbally uh, as opposed to visually or? Uh, yeah. that, that's exactly right. And it's funny, when we got together, we never discussed, um, are you a photographer? Are you going to take pictures? <laughs> Here we go. We, uh, both of us would have said, no, I'm not. I don't even own a camera. But we never clarified that before we ended up together. But it was one of the things we had in common. And it, it was a belief, and, and I don't mean any disrespect to avid photographers, whether they're amateur or professional. Now, I should have no disrespect because I've done two collaborative books with wonderful photographers, their photographs and my poems. But in our case, we did translate what we saw into words instead of into another uh, more profound or professional visual picture. And we felt that it was easy to let a camera get in the way of the real seeing that we wanted to do to be able to write about it. Um, I certainly uh, get annoyed if I'm um, with another group of tourists somewhere and we have to keep stopping for them to take pictures. I have to give myself lectures about patience when that happens because I wish we could just all look and take it into our bodies. And I have maybe the poet's um, sense of fate. If that's something should be remembered, it will be remembered. And uh, Rilke talked about blood memory, how before you were ready to write about something, you almost had to forget about it and it had to enter your bloodstream. Oh. And then it came out in the kind of words that would give it credit, uh, the kind of articulation that would mean something deeper than mere representation. So I, I think that's what Patrick would have agreed to. Mm. Thank, thank I, you. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. I was thinking about um, why you put yourself into this, this amazing experience that you did. And you say in the book that one of the reasons is your mom and that she was from Greece, although you're careful to say she was from the mountains, not from the coast where you went. Can you talk about that a bit more? Was it really to, to honor her? Was it a tribute? to where she came from, um, for you to give up 
all that time and well-being and putting yourself in that situation. I think uh, certainly that was part of it. I, I, I've been thinking about her a lot for whatever reason. 14 years after she died, she died shortly before 9-11, actually, with, uh, you know, the, with the videos of the attacks playing in, in the background on the news channel. Well, um, my father and I uh, were tending to her in the last few weeks. Um, for some reason, uh, maybe because this was another big crisis, international crisis, I started remembering that. And, um, and also, as it happens, I was starting to learn Greek. She never wanted to speak Greek um, when we were children. She wanted us to assimilate like many uh, Greeks of her generation, um, or some, not many, some Greeks of her generation. So I was learning, studying Greek and thinking about her. And then this crisis happened. And, and I read about what the fishermen in Mithymna or Molivos were doing. They were sailing out every day and risking their lives in, this, in the gales, because this was the fall now, October, when the, you know, the winds are high, to, to try to rescue um, some of these rafts that were coming across that were getting in trouble uh, halfway across the 10 kilometer crossing from Turkey to Greece. And I was, uh, I've never been one for ethnic identification. I think it's, um, you know, it can, it can warm the cockles of your heart, but it's also very dangerous, you know, in the form of patriotism. But I really felt, I felt this kind of pride. And um, I thought, you know, I, these people are just going way beyond the call of duty. Lesbos, like the rest of Greece, is broke. These people are broke. Nobody's buying their fish right now because so many refugees are drowning. People are afraid of eating the fish in case the fish have been, you know, eating corpses, frankly. And so the fishermen were, were struggling, um, but they were still going out every day and risking their lives, many of the fishermen. And I just, it, it inspired me. Plus, I thought maybe I would be able to, to use my, my limited Greek to sort of help, because I knew very few people speak Greek outside of Greece. Uh, as it turned out, I was no help at all. My, I, I couldn't understand them. They're talking way too fast. So I, I, as a translator, I wasn't any help. But uh, I figured, you know, I got... Um, two strong hands and I'll just go and pitch in any way I can. So yes, I think it really had a lot to do with my mother. And the, I'll just say one more thing. The, the weird thing is after I got there, uh, uh, several nights later, I was on a beach where refugee rafts were coming in. I was working with a bunch of other volunteers and it was pandemonium, totally disorganized. Uh, nobody knew what they were doing, but anyway, it all worked out okay. But then I read a plaque in a cafe and it said that all the Greek refugees who came over from Turkey to Greece in 1922, up almost a million of them, or many of them, came across exactly that same passage because it's the closest, it's the uh, cl shortest crossing from Turkey to Greece. So uh, but several hundred thousand Greek refugees almost 100 years ago had crossed that way. And I realized that a couple of distant relatives um, would have been among them. And I thought, so I'm here, how could I not have, have known that? And I thought, no, I'm, I'm, I always knew about this crossing and about the refugee exodus from Turkey to Greece. And I must have, it must have just been there in the back of my mind. And, and you know that this is how poems sometimes happen. You talk about poems being prescient in your book. And I think in the way of a poet, I sort of knew on some level, and that was part of the thing that drove me to do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great. It's so funny doing this on Zoom. I would feel so much more comfortable sitting beside you on stage and we pick up on each other's body cues to know when one of us jump in or not. You know, I was thinking about you not wanting to um, digress imaginatively in a way in your book um, because you were writing about real people involved in real things. And when I was writing this, um, and I went back to how Patrick and I met in our tumultuous, um, inflammatory early years of our relationship. Um, I read those parts to Patrick. I, I let him know that I was writing this book. Um, and he would say, well, wait a minute. I don't remember it happening that way. <laughs> I remember it happening this way. And then I would say, oh, okay, well, let me think about that. And sometimes I would revise it with, with his advice and and his, uh, his version as part of the story. And I was very aware of that while I was doing the writing. And I didn't read him any of the parts where I talk about his illness uh, because it was hard enough. He was going through hard enough. And I didn't want to add to his um, fear or his sadness or 
his need to keep trying to comfort me and make sure I was okay when he, when he wasn't okay. Um, but he said to me shortly before he died, uh, keep going with the book. Um, I also read him all the parts about the cats, the five cats that we had in our 40 years together. I wrote their biographies and he really, he really enjoyed those, uh, those sections. So I was pleased that, um, that what I was doing in a way got his nod of approval, at least for, for half of what's in the book and not for the parts about sickness. When, when you were reading things to him, you said sometimes he remembered things differently and, and at times you made adjustments. Did he ever ask you, uh, oh, I hope this isn't, I was going to say, did he ever say, don't put that in or? Um, no, but I didn't read everything to him. So. <laughs> <laughs> he might have. He was a little worried. Um, he He's had a, a good relationship with the, the two youngest sons who yeah. are now in their 40s. He was a little worried about about what they might think about some of the things that I wrote about. And so he was kind of trying to censor me on a couple of those things. And I didn't say anything. I just let a few days pass. And then he said to me over breakfast, you know, it's okay, babe. Like, tell the story. And uh, what will happen will happen. Mm -hmm. So I hope they'll be okay with it. Who knows? Okay. Have yeah. you received any feedback? back from any of the people that are in your book oh yes <laughs> okay just, just to get back for a moment to the photography i love good photography too and i admire photographers so yeah so like you i wasn't i'm not putting down photographers i just ha i have a terrible eye and i would rather yeah. remember it another way but there are photographs in in reaching mythimna um that kind of happened at the last stage i think they're beautiful photographs they're by a photographer uh, who, whose pseudonym is Neil McQueen, and he's, he's a wonderful photographer. He's been on Lesbos for a long time taking photos. But, but he's a difficult man, as you, at least as you portrayed him in the book, right? I do. I do portray him as difficult, and when we wanted to get his permission, he was difficult, uh, and in, a, in an interesting way, though. I actually liked him. He was curmudgeonly. He didn't seem to like me at all, but I'm old enough now that that, does, that doesn't that sort of thing doesn't preclude my finding them interesting and liking them. Um, very interesting guy, uh, like very intense and rule oriented, uh, but like I say, great photographer. So we went to him, um, Bibli Weiss really wanted photos. I said, no, I don't think there should be photos. They said, no, these photos are great. Why don't you want them in? I finally said, okay, so let's go and ask him. And they said, should we show him your book first? Because he's portrayed portrayed as kind of a grumpy guy. And I said, yes, absolutely, he should see it. Uh, and then we'll just let the chips fall where they may. So he he really manned up. He he only got grumpy about a couple things. He said, okay, I get it. You think I'm grumpy. You, you don't realize, and I didn't realize then, I was, I was uh, diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome a year ago. Um, so you may just not have understood the kind of person I am. And I said, well, I didn't, and I apologize. I, I really, um, Maybe it was stupid of me not to see that. At any rate, he, he was good about it. He asked me to change one thing. Um, he thought there was one detail that would get him in trouble with a, um, a group of volunteers over there who everyone found very difficult, but he said they're actually good, hardworking people. You've kind of um, talked about some of the bad things they did in this scene and you show me a, a agreeing with you and I would never have agreed. And I thought it's very possible that my memory's faulty, faulty here, or that I thought the scene worked better with him agreeing with me. So I made that small change. Uh, he's still kind of grumpy in the book. And he, on the whole, he's very happy to have his photos in there. And he, he said he liked the book. Um, so we, we parted friends, you know. Um, but yeah, he was, he was upset. And, and I got really down about it for a little while. I thought, oh, do I have to change all of this? And have I hurt his feelings? And you know what it's like sometimes, uh, in the end, you just have to decide this is the story. And I think he's a good character and a good person in the book. He's just grumpy. Yeah. And always, it's our story. And, and we know that. And I hope people who, who read it know that too. Um, this is my second, second memoir. My other memoir it was about growing up in Saskatchewan. And right, right. When my brother read it. He said, you know, Lauren, a lot of what you said didn't happen or didn't happen that way. And I said, well, write your own bloody memoir, right? 
this is fine. This is my version. You go ahead and write the correct version if, if you want to. Yeah. I changed all the names of my char characters. And I said in a little forward about a note on naming, I said, I changed the names because this is my version of these people. So I understand that they are in some way fictional, not quite fictional characters, but somewhere between fictional characters and real people because they won't always remember what I remember. And I want to give them, you know, as a sort of plausible deniability. Um, oh, I had another question. I remember, I brought up the idea that poems are prescient. This is your idea. Um, how they sometimes convey knowledge you're not yet ready to acknowledge or aren't even remotely aware of. Um, I really like that passage in your book. I don't remember the particulars now, but you were talking about writing poems that showed you that your life was changing. And, 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 and some part of you knew that. Uh, the part I call the night mind, the part that gives us dreams, and sometimes those prescient prophetic dreams, those powerful dreams, not just the nonsense dreams. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering, is a poet on one sense dreaming the words onto the page? You're awake, you're alert, you're able, you know, you've still got control of your grammar and everything. And yet there's some part of you, it's almost like uh, uh, the night mind part of you is dreaming a poem onto a page if it's a good poem. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And, and I think that's the way I wrote this book too. I, I, I in a sense, dreamed the words on the page. And um, I didn't worry about um, my intent even or the impact or how I was going to get from here to there I just wrote and tried to lay one word after another I wrote the book as I would write a poem I went go back to sentences and read them out loud and get the sentence right before I moved on I must have I must have read this book out loud a hundred times as I was writing it. So there was a constant revision. It wasn't writing one draft and then a second draft and then a third draft, although that happened in some ways in terms of structure. But um, you just have to trust, I think, that deep unconscious part of you. I, I always feel like poetry is like putting a taproot down um, through layers of earth until it strikes cold, clear water. And then you hope you can suck that up into language. And that's what I attempted to do with, with writing this book, because that's how I know how to write. I know how to write as a poet. I don't know how to write as a, as a, fiction, as a fiction writer. Mm -hmm. I was thinking too, in terms of um, the, some of the volunteers might've been upset. Some might've been delighted when they got your book. Of course, with Patrick, I don't have to worry because he's not here to be angry at me or to argue with me. But I was very aware of him being in my room in a way when I wrote this book. Mm -hmm. And when I revised it, that I wanted, like you were to the people you worked with, I wanted to be as true to him and his life as I could be. Um, I hope cleanly and without excess and and with love. Yeah, that gets back to, yeah, you, you did all those things and it's very moving. Um, it gets back to what I was saying before about poetry and how you write about the body, bodies in ecstasy, bodies suffering. And this must have been harder in so many ways, um, but I just think you honored him in, in, in every way. So, and I'm going to change the subject before we all get sort of choked up. Uh, your anecdote about receiving the Order of Canada, the call, about you, they made you an officer of the Order of Canada. And I think how you said it is that your joy, your delight was almost instantly superseded by this anxiety uh, because, you know, Patrick was t 10 years older, I think. Yeah. And, and you know, equally accomplished, but he hadn't received it yet. Uh, and I think this has happened to a lot of artist couples, but we all know it happens more often to the woman. Like, I think there are men who would also worry, how is, how is she gonna feel? But it does seem to be more a weight that women carry. How is the man gonna feel if I get this? Um, uh, I, I don't know if I really have a question here. I just thought that was a very interesting scene. And you talked about how you and Patrick you know, fairly quickly worked it out, which I think is a sign of a really strong relationship. 
Yeah. It, it was wonderful for me to fall in love with another poet and, and also fraught, right? As you know, because we are, even poets are competitive. I hate to shock the world and let them know. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're living with someone and, and you want them to succeed. You want them to do well. You want them to get invited to Germany and Chile and China, but you want to be invited too. And, and so there's always a fine line you have to walk between love and support and envy and, and the odd, you know, bit of jealousy and how you're going to overcome that and be a better, more rounder person. And it's always a struggle for me to be a better person. And, and certainly it is in the poetry world as well. I have the feeling we should be answering questions soon, shouldn't we? I think so. Uh, if there I, are. Well, that's, a, that's a good segue because I was I was gonna pop in I, shortly there, so I, I was gonna suggest it to you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we have a few to get started. Um, Lorna, the first one is for you, and it's from Helga, and she says, Lorna, you are obviously very personally and emotionally invested in your writing and your subject. You said that you had to write about your story to deal with the pain, but do you find that you sometimes need to detach in order to get your thoughts in order, or does the emotion help order them? She's asking for a friend. <laughs> no, that's uh, that's a, a really wonderful, complex question. You know, I, um, I've always been able to write about very troubling things almost in their instant of happening. And I don't know if that's a bad character trait or a good one. I just have to finally accept that it's who I am. When my mother was dying, I, I went to a writer's retreat for a week and I wrote about what I was feeling about her, her death uh, before she was even dead. And uh, I used to beat myself up for that, but then I said, you know, this is, this is the way you live. This is the way you navigate your world. You turn the language for better or for worse. And, and I try to turn the language, not in a sentimental, overly wrought way, but in the way that an artist does um, with some aesthetic distance. So, that happens even in the act of writing when I am so broken inside, I can barely breathe. I can still somehow write the words. Now, whether I do well or not is another thing, but I, I have the practice I, I need and I, and I want to do that. And I worry very much about whether the writing's good when I put it on the page, not just is it dealing with all this pain but is it good writing? And if it isn't, then I want to put it in a drawer and show no one. I hope I answered the question. I might have gotten distracted and digressive too. No, no, I think you, I think you did. Um, the next one, uh, conveniently, the questions have gone. They're alternating. So Steve, that comes for you, and this is from Mark. And um, so you did talk about some of the reasons that you traveled. Uh, to Lesbos, but he said, did you travel there with the intention of, of writing about your experience? That's a great question. Um, the truth is, no, I was in the middle of a novel and I was between drafts of a novel. All I was thinking about was, um, was finishing that novel and I was struggling with it at that point. Uh, in fact, we're supposed to read about a minute more each at the very end and I was going to read a short, a very short passage where I talk about some of the reasons I, I that I think I went and one of them was I was at that moment you know in that novel writing about fictional Mediterranean refugees and when as the the refugee influx or exflux got worse and worse there I, I it made me feel if I could do something you know with real people instead of these fictional characters on the page I'm tired of writing fiction uh, and poetry too, for you know, years and years and years, always making stuff up, and it just felt time to do something real. So I wasn't actually think, you know, as I went, I figured I'm sure I'll write an article or something about what I'm doing, but I didn't think, I didn't wasn't thinking at all about um, you know writing a memoir or, or gathering material. In fact, I didn't even take very many notes when I was there. Um. And well, you talked about being tired of, of writing poetry. The next question for Lorna is, are you currently diving back into poetry? I am. I um, This book um, ends with Patrick still alive. Um, and it ends with hope that his seven specialists will suddenly figure out what's wrong with him and 
come up with an effective treatment. And I think he believed that would happen too. Um, we were as honest in his last months as we could be with one another. And I think he thought there was a chance he'd get better. Um, so the book ends with him alive. And then my publishers pressured me to write a postscript mm -hmm. uh, where I say that he died. And uh, I said, I'll see what I can do, um, but it will be very brief. And I really would have preferred the book end with him alive. And maybe that was me trying to revise reality as well as uh, write my own nonfiction. Anyway, so after he died, um, I started writing poems. I went into poems um, expressing my grief rather than my worries and fears that he wouldn't be with me. I started to write in poems about my sorrow that I was alone and he was no longer here. So I think I have a small manuscript of poetry about that. Um, I haven't looked at them for a while, so I'll go back and, and see how they're holding up. Um, oh, also Helga said, thank you for the great answer earlier. So oh. You did answer her question. <laughs> um, so Steve, this is maybe a bit of a writing advice question, um, but Janet says, I know you mentioned you were careful about now um, not disclosing a lot about people you worked with. I worked in West Africa for two years as a teacher 20 years ago. It was long enough ago that no privacy would be breached. How far should I digress from how I, uh, for, from how I recall them in actual fact, and how far should I digress and embellish? It, it, it's a great question. It's a huge question. I'll try to answer it briefly, because um, I'm sure there are other questions for Lorna and for me. So um, what I would say is how far you digress, it totally depends on whether you want to do a kind of memoir that stays fairly, fairly close to the truth as you remember it. I, bearing in mind that your memory has already done some of the work of fictionalizing what happened to a certain extent. Um, or do you want to just go all the way towards fiction and give yourself total freedom? There's no reason you can't write, say, a collection of linked short stories or a novel based on your experience. I mean, it's it's just a, it's a spectrum. Uh, there's, there's no hard and fast difference between memoir and fiction. I mean, I think they are different on, on some level, but there is a spectrum. And I'd say it's a, it's a matter of choosing what's going to work best for you. I, I chose to stay fairly close, but I do, did give myself some leeway to digress, uh, sorry, to, um, to improvise. And I certainly changed the chronology where I had to, uh, like put some events two days earlier, just to make the flow work better and to make it work as a, I mean, you're trying to create, uh, you know, you're trying to create art, right? So you, it, you want it to flow right and be true to the, to a higher truth than the truth of the actual chronology or the facts. Um, so yeah, just find your place on that spectrum, I would say, where you feel comfortable. And you could start off, you could just try two different things. Start writing as factually, quote unquote, as you can, and also start another document where you're writing in a really fictional way. See which mode you, feels more comfortable for you. See which mode seems to be working better. Thank you for that. Um, Lorna, this is a follow-up on um, your mention of the manuscript of poems. And it asks, uh, does your current manuscript of poems include glimmers of hope and peace, even as you have grieved? I think the hope and peace <clears throat> comes in the writing of it. I, I think the fact that writers anywhere write about the dark times, to quote Berthold Brecht, uh, in the dark times, is there still singing about the dark times? Yes, there is singing about the dark times. Um, in the dark times, is there still singing? Yes, they're singing about the dark times. That for me is extremely hopeful. I don't know if I'm expressing any hope for my being able to find joy in my new life. Mm -hmm. Probably, probably there isn't in those words right now. But just the fact that anyone creates out of tragedy I find to be a very optimistic, life-enforcing thing. Mm -hmm. um, Steve, one thing I, I found interesting uh, when you were talking today was just um, how you repeatedly refer to the people in your book as characters. Um, did you find that that helped you with the, 
with getting that on the page to imagine them as interesting characters as opposed to these black and white individuals that you know you were recounting the tales of yes absolutely that's that's what's going on and that's also why i changed the names well in most cases omeros his real name is is omar he wouldn't mind my saying that he just said i choose omeros as my name in the book i let him choose his name um for various reasons I won't get into, but I did change the names because I wanted to give myself a little freedom and also to protect them at the same time if they wanted protection, as it turned out, Omeros did not. He wanted to be called Homer, which yeah. is the Greek form. Yeah, that's what I, <laughs> I, that's what I, was, I was guessing was, was the reason, but that's great. Um, so we have just a few minutes left so i think if we want to turn it over now to um a final brief reading from both of you and then um i will come back to wrap up the event i will uh i will leave it to you for now and i don't know who wants to go first if you want to rock paper scissors <laughs> in or yeah lorna why don't why don't i start out and then you finish the evening Okay, sounds good. Okay. And I really loved being with you tonight. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, cheers. And maybe we, I hope we'll be able to clink glasses uh, on the other side <laughs> of this pandemic. Um, Me too. Me too. Soon. Okay, I'll just read quickly. Uh, this is from about uh, 10 pages into the book. I'm still not sure why I'm here beyond a wish to do something useful involving flesh and blood people instead of invented characters and words on a screen. Three nights ago on the phone with my daughter, 19 and now living away from home, I'd mentioned my impulse and then thought, let's see you act for a change, not just pipe dream and make principled noises, not just write about Mediterranean refugees in a novel as I was then doing. I think I'll just stop there and turn it over to Lorna. Okay. I'm going to read um, introductory page to the book. Well, it begins with a quotation from Patrick's memoir, There is a Season. But then there is this poem, and I should say the, the book is studded with, with poetry. I think the kind of punctuation marks, or I'm not sure, they're taking people to a different place than where the prose is taking the reader. Anyway, the title for the book, my original title was a really bad one, and then my agent said, I think you should call the book Poem Me, Poem Me, which is based on this poem. And then even poets who I mentioned this to said, what? And I thought, okay, this is not a good idea. <laughs> so the publisher, thank goodness, came up with Through the Garden, A Love Story with Cats, which I think is a much better title. But here's the poem, Poem Me. I came to him that first night and said, Poem Me. And he did. He came to me that first night and said, poem me, and I did. Of our hours, we made a poem. Of our years, we made a poem. Many things happened in between. Many things were rubbed out, repeated, neglected, ignored, stained, thrown away. But this morning, he said, poem me. This morning, I said, poem me. And we made of our lives a poem. Right. Thank you. That's a beautiful, beautiful section to end tonight's event. So um, just once again, thank you so much to Lorna and Steve for joining us here today um, for this beautiful and very, very honest, very open um, conversation. Um, a reminder that Steve's books are available for sale and Lorna's books are available for pre-order at Novel Idea. Uh, thank you again to McClellan and Stewart and Biblioasis and to Novel Idea and thank you our audience for joining us and for supporting Kingston Writers Fest. Um, I just want to quickly say uh, we as mentioned at the beginning of this event we are doing a series every two weeks um, so in another two weeks we have um, Thomas King in conversation with Ben Sharland, and that's on September 2nd. Unbelievable to think that September is, our, is just two weeks of, away. Um, and Thomas will be talking about his brand new, very funny novel called Indians on Vacation. So be sure to check out the website for dates and times and to register for this and our other wonderful author events. Stay safe and so, stay well and good night. So thank you all. Good night, everybody. Good night.